What it do, psychology students? It's your old pal, Mr. Carly. Uh, Going to do a quick review of memory for the psychology exam tomorrow, which will be December 4th, 2023. So you know this is actually from this year. Also, the hair hair would probably give it away too. It's like getting, getting pretty crazy. Anyway, uh, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and uh, smash that like button. Keep those likes higher, those dislikes. So anyway, uh, so there's only one topic for this assessment. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's about memory. It's one topic, like I said. And uh, yeah, so there's first thing we talked about was the one of one of the accepted models of memory, which is, I think, the most common, but uh, the Sh Shifkin Atkinson, Schiffler Atkinson model. I'm sorry, I'm saying it wrong. But anyway, three types or stages of memory creation. So basically what happens is, is you have sensory input memory, and then that leads to getting into your working or your short-term memory, which are technically a little bit different, but I often use them interchangeably because they both are short-term types of memory. It's just working memory is more keeping things in your head, whereas short-term is just the fleeting types of memory that you have. Um, and then eventually that goes to long-term. Uh, within that stage, you have these processes where you would have encoding. And the line between encoding and storage is pretty thin. Uh, it's almost, I almost sometimes think of them like they're the same thing. You, the encoding is like the writing of the memory and eventually it's complete and it's stored somewhere in your brain um, as a neural pathway. And then leads to, uh, eventually you'll have to have retrieval of that memory from your long-term in order to remember it. So three types or stages. These, this is what I was asking for, but in between those, you kind of have these stages. I just don't, I don't always like to put encoding in between sensory and working because it isn't exactly, that's not exactly how it works. Um, in order to get into long term, you have to have encoding and storage. Um, so, yeah. Difference between uh, interrograde and um, retrograde. So, retrograde is uh, forgetting or not being able to remember things prior to a specific event, and that usually fixes itself. Uh, and the other one, enterograde, it's usually because of a, a head trauma of some sort, concussion, uh, getting smacked in the head, <laughs> something like that, brain injury. Uh, enterograde is uh, not being able to create new memories. Uh, it's usually a result of surgery or brain infection that's going to be long lasting. So that's how it works. There's somebody standing outside my door. I can't tell if they want to come in or not. Oh, I don't know. Some habit. Anyway, so retrograde, interrograde, retro. People when people say something's retro, they're usually talking about how it's prior to something or it's looking back in the past. And then interrograde is like interior. Interior is actually like uh, the front of yourself. Um, so interior chain, things like that. So entero would be forward looking, going forward. Um, this is like Clive Waring uh, from the. Uh, oops, did I say infection. Clive Waring from the video we watched. Um, Another thing, uh, something like deja vu, uh, you could say working memory, it has specific uh, limitations of capacity. You could talk about misinformation. Uh, you could talk about um, interference, both retroactive and proactive. Um, yeah, there are a variety of things. Uh, sometimes people experience what's called jamais, jamais vu, which is like not being able to remember something you know you should remember. Um, there's also any type of issues of encoding. Uh, so like attention, um, not rehearsing, things of that nature. Those are all limitations of memory beyond just amnesia. Uh, what are the difference between short-term and, oh, we should also, sorry, we should also say long-term memory, or sorry, um, false memories, susceptible to misinformation, things like that. Okay. Uh, what are the key differences between short-term and long-term memory? The first one is um, uh, capacity. So long-term is believed to be unlimited. Unlimited. Uh, short-term is the general theory is seven plus or minus two pieces of information. Um, you could also talk about types. So um, long-term is implicit and explicit, whereas short-term is generally just information in your head. There's a, there's sounds, um, 
uh, visuals. And then there's like your central executive, which is like being able to go through different uh, browser types, things like that. Um, you could also talk about like the need for rehearsal. So you need to rehearse things, need to rehearse things to keep it in working memory, but you don't need to, to keep it in long-term memory. Uh, technically, if you've remembered something or retrieved it long enough, uh, it'll just kind of stay there and you'll be able to retrieve it sometimes with some cues, uh, but usually um, on your own. Uh, yeah, so those are the big differences, I guess. Uh, obviously, if you want to talk about long-term, short-term differences, uh, you need to encode short-term in order to have long-term. So long-term kind of relies on or on the short-term memory. So that'd be an example. Um, all right. Which one represents sensory explicit long-term memory or implicit long-term memory? So encoding words that your teacher has just said in class. Well, if it involves encoding, it's usually going to be working or sensory. So I didn't use sensory. It's going to be sensory. Or sorry, since I didn't put working memory as a choice, then we're going to go with sensory. So this is going to be your acoustic or echoic, echoic. Remembering your locker combination. So remembering it uh, based off of just remembering the, the numbers or the letters that some people have is going to be explicit long-term. Remembering it based on the feel of rotating it, your muscle memory is going to be different. That's going to be, even if you don't, like what we're saying here is like you don't actually even remember the numbers, that's going to be implicit. That's a procedural, procedural, good. The meanings of words on a vocab test. Okay, that again, that's a semantic type. That's meaning of words, vocab, explicit. Okay, it's going to be a semantic memory that you have, a fact. Same thing with this. This is also, I know it wasn't asked of you, but it's always good to know more things. Um, semantic. Name your favorite band musical artist. Again, even though it might not take a long time for you to think of it, it's an explicit long-term memory, it's semantic. And encoding visual information to be stored later. Okay, good, so that's, that's an iconic form. So that's sensory iconic. Okay, there they are again. Sensory, explicit, implicit, explicit, explicit, sensory. Going on, difference between recall and recognition, recall, this is when uh, information is uh, retrieved with, um, it can be queued recall, without access to the information. And what I mean by that is like, you don't have the information in front of you. Um, you have to actually pull it out of your long-term memory. The difference with uh, recognition is where you just have to recognize the information you're supposed to remember. So information is retrieved among or amongst aggregate data is what we say, or just lots of information. So you have a whole bunch of information, you know the right thing, the thing that's in your memory is in front of you, and you have to pull it out or recognize it. So recall is more difficult, but that's going to be generally more long lasting if you can do it that way. There's also queued recall where you're not recognizing the information amongst a bunch of different information, but you are, uh, you're given something to help prime you or make you think of what you're supposed to think of. How much information can, uh, your working memory, short-term memory usually hold. That's going to be, the, again, the theory that's been around since like the 50s is seven plus or minus two uh, chunks of information. What are some strategies for improving retrieval information? Well, a lot of the things that improve encoding are also going to improve retrieval. So I'll put this one down, chunking, because I just said it, okay? Um, but memory project, whatever ones you did on those ones, those would be really good ones to do. Uh, retrieval can also be helped with things like uh, mnemonic devices, which is kind of a broad... Um, way of looking at strategies. One example that we did in class was peg words. So taking a word and assigning it in association with another piece of information or word uh, can help. Um, Self-reference is a good one. So making things about you or applicable to your life. So those are three. I think you should use some that you use for your project. Um, but overall, those are the answers to the review guide. I don't think there's anything else. So if you have any questions, let me know. Send me an email. Uh, I don't really check YouTube comments, so don't comment a question. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's it. And uh, that's the review guide. All right. Sounds good. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow, hopefully. Uh, peace.